So not all Amish homes are the same. You're not going to find all these features in every Amish home. And you can have homes that can look quite fancy. You can have homes that are very plain. It's just different ways of being Amish. Number one, linoleum flooring. Linoleum is generally inexpensive. It's quite durable. And it's a material you'll commonly see on the floors in Amish homes. You'll see it in the kitchen. You'll see it in the bathroom. You'll see it in the uh, main living rooms. Uh, you'll see it in the bedrooms as well. It's a very durable, easily cleaned surface. I'm calling this linoleum. It may actually be vinyl in some cases. You know, vinyl may be called linoleum. Generally, you hear it described as linoleum with the Amish. So you'll see linoleum common in Amish homes. Now, where you won't see it are in the homes of some of the plainer Amish. For example, the Swartz and Truber Amish and another group called the Troyer Amish also doesn't use this. So Troyer Amish have a quite big community in New York. The floors in Swartz and Truber Amish homes, for example, are an unvarnished hardwood. And I've seen this uh, wooden floor in other uh, Amish homes, like for example, in the community at Seymour, Missouri, which has a quite plain appearance to their homes. They have some kind of a wooden flooring there. Number two, spacious common rooms. This is something that kind of makes sense when you think about, you know, the Amish have, of course, large families. So you need large living areas, living spaces where families can gather together when they're visiting, when there's just the family spending time together. You know, you often have rooms that kind of create a pretty large interior space. So the kitchen might kind of blend into the main uh, room of the house. Another example, some of my Amish friends in Pennsylvania, they live in a roughly 200 year old farmhouse. It's actually a double farmhouse where you have two farmhouses basically attached. There's a middle sort of parlor room that sort of divides the two houses, let's say, and uh, there are doors on either end. And if you open the doors, it opens up to the kitchen of each home. And when you do that, you create a really long, you know, single room there. And that's where they would have, for example, uh, their youth group singing. I attended a youth group singing, uh, which was in that space. So you can see from one kitchen all the way to the other. It's a pretty, pretty long distance. I don't know, it's a 30, 40, 50 feet. So they had dozens of youth in there. But this is something you'll see in new Amish construction as well. And I actually didn't catch this really, this detail until I had my father along with me to visit uh, some Amish, uh, I think it was in Indiana. And he had kind of a builder's eye, and so he noticed that the room seemed to be quite large and spacious. And another reason this kind of makes sense is that if you see the Amish lighting system, and I'm going to talk about that next, having a more spacious area, you can more easily illuminate uh, the area so everyone can kind of, you know, read at night or do whatever they're doing with a single lamp. Number three, non-electric lighting. Amish light their homes in different ways. Propane and natural gas lighting are quite common in Amish homes. So you may have this in the form of a propane lantern that's hung from a hook in the ceiling. There'd be a heat shield up there to kind of protect the ceiling from the heat it generates. Or uh, you may have a larger mobile unit where it's basically a, a fuel tank with a pole that goes out of the center of it. And there's like a furniture cabinet built around that and it's on wheels so you can kind of wheel that around. You know, to where you need the lighting. You'll also see this with the fixtures actually built into the home. So in the bathroom, you'd have a fixture, you'd have them strategically placed throughout the home where you need light. This is a pretty strong light source. It's pretty bright. Uh, the downside is that it generates a lot of heat. I remember visiting Amish homes when I was selling books and I'd go into the home and it would be like later at night and uh, I'd probably go and I'd come out of those homes pretty dehydrated. Because, uh, you know, I don't go in probably a little thirsty already from a hot summer day. And then 20 minutes in there sitting under the light uh, can kind of dry out. And generally now when I visit my Amish friends and we're playing like a board game or something, I try to uh, not sit next to that light if possible. So quite effective form of lighting uh, that generates a lot of heat. Well, that's good in winter, of course, but not so much in the summertime. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, do me a favor and give it, give it a big like. I appreciate that, but only if you really like it. So the more conservative Amish will be using the oil and kerosene lamps. And communities where they do that would be the among the Swartz and Trooper Amish, for example. Another example would be the Amish at New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, which is a quite a plain community. Those produce a dimmer light, but also less heat. My friends in Lancaster County 
when I lived with them for an extended period of time. And if I was out kind of late, they would leave uh, an oil lantern burning on the kitchen table for me when I came home so I'd have something to see by, which was always a nice thing to see when you came back. Amish also use battery powered lights. They use classic flashlights. They use the kind of the heavier duty uh, DeWalt is the name of the brand of these kind of heavy duty lights where you've got a basically a battery pack on the bottom and the light you know unit is actually quite powerful so it generates a pretty bright light. They often have like a hook on them as well. So that they would charge the battery you know at night using power created by a diesel generator or it could be solar power in some cases. So you may actually come across light switches in some Amish homes. So what's going on there? Well, what's going on there is probably that that home was built by a non-Amish person and then later purchased by the Amish family. It's not connected to public power, but you know they'll leave the light switches in the home. You also may see a place for a light switch in a newly built Amish home. So some Amish will build in like an electric system and have a place for the switch to go. And why do they do that? Well, you know, they're not using it for themselves, but in the case that they end up having to sell their home, that makes it more attractive to a non-Amish buyer. You may see that especially in a smaller or newer community where uh, the community is not so established. So it's not for sure there's going to be a lot of potential Amish buyers if you decide you need to leave. Just to mention, you actually will see quite a few Amish homes that are offered for sale uh, online. Previously, owned, you know, Amish owned homes, right? So you can see that they're obviously Amish and sometimes they're even described as an Amish home or farm. By the way, my name's Eric Westner. Obviously, I'm not Amish, but I've actually visited somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 Amish homes. It was a book selling job that I had where I was visiting a lot of Amish families in a pretty short amount of time. Pretty intense job. I still need to tell that story on a video. So that's my background on this topic. I've been in a lot of Amish homes. I've lived with the Amish. I also run the Amish America site at AmishAmerica.com. Number four, a propane or natural gas refrigerator. So the Amish use refrigerators that kind of look like conventional refrigerators. Uh, well, I mean, I, actually, I should say <laughs> refrigerators from like the 80s and 90s before they became these kind of giant metallic uh, smart refrigerators or whatever we have now. They typically have the classic look about them of the sort of the top freezer door and then the lower door for the refrigerator part. These are made by at least two companies that I'm aware of. Uh, one would be Crystal Cold of Arcola, Illinois. That's the Arthur, Illinois community. And the other would be Easy Freeze of Shipshawana in uh, Indiana and in the northern Indiana settlement. These are marketed to non-Amish buyers as well as to the Amish. So you can find these online. Now, in Amish homes where this type of technology is not permitted, they're going to use primarily ice-based cooling. So that could be ice boxes, it could be ice houses. One good example of a community would be Joga County, Ohio, where ice cooling is common. You'll see throughout the community these kind of commercial ice vending machine type things where you have, you know, the big ice uh, written on the side in red and blue letters. You'll see those throughout the community and that's one source of ice for the Amish there. Another one, and I noticed this when I was selling books in this community, sometimes I'd see like notes on the door left for the ice man. So they'd have an ice man delivering ice. In some communities, they actually harvest their own ice. So they'll basically go out to a local body of water when it's cold enough and the men will have like a special saw and they'll have like picks and hooks and things and they'll they'll cut up, you know, they'll cut out chunks of ice and then they load that up onto a big wagon. They've probably got a couple of Belgian horses to haul it there. Then they have ice houses, which are basically small kind of buildings that have a metal exterior, and then inside they'll have some kind of insulation. Uh, I believe they use sawdust. You put the ice in there, and you've got a source of cooling that'll last for many months. Very old-fashioned way of cooling, but that's your that's the alternative if your church doesn't permit the propane or natural gas refrigerator. Finally, number five, a basement. So basements are super common in Amish homes. Basements are very functional spaces that the Amish use for a lot of different purposes. It's a nice cool place to store canned goods. You often have like a second kitchen down in the basement where you can do canning. 
Uh, you'll have a sink down there. You know, it's a second area where you can actually do some food processing. It's usually a cool space, so that's nice in the summer. A good place to do the laundry. So you often have the, you know, the ringer washer that's common among the Amish uh, in the basement. You can hold church in the basement. So Amish have their church services at their homes. So that's either in the home of the uh, family, or it would be like in a workshop or another building space outside the home on the property there. So with the basement, it uh, can be a little tight in some basements, but I've been to Amish church in a basement before. The basement makes a good play space for children. With one of my Amish friend's sons, we played uh, tennis ball hockey. Uh, we played uh, in their basement in that big space. Also have like a youth singing in the basement. I've been to one of those before. So it's a quite functional space. Some Amish actually kind of live in their basements in the warmer months. You know, you want to escape the heat. And in some places it gets quite hot. Amish don't have air conditioning in the home, uh, except for some very rare exceptions, like for medical purposes in some cases, in some communities. Some of them spend the daytime hours and eat in the basement. And you may have a couch down there, a sofa. So quite handy. Uh, I've even seen workout equipment in Amish basements before, uh, like a exercise machine, like an exercise bike, because some Amish like to get exercise that way. Looking at this from a little bit different angle, I did a video on five surprising things you'll find in Amish homes. So you can check that out here. I make two videos per week. Hit subscribe so you can stay in the loop on, on upcoming videos. Thanks. See ya.